Chapter 4 of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter 4 The Divining Rod, Part 1. From the remotest period, a rod has been regarded as the symbol of power and authority, and Holy Scripture employs it in the popular sense. Thus David speaks of thy rod and thy staff comforting me, and Moses works his miracles before Pharaoh with the rod as emblem of divine commission. It was his rod which became a serpent, which turned the water of Egypt into blood, which opened the waves of the Red Sea and restored them to their former level, which smote the rock of stone so that the water gushed out abundantly. The rod of Aaron acted an oracular part of the contest with the princes. Laid up before the ark, it budded and brought forth almonds. In this instance we have it no longer as a symbol of authority, but as a means of divining the will of God. And as such, it became liable to abuse. Thus Hosea rebukes the chosen people for practicing similar divinations. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. Long before this, Jacob had made a different use of rods, employing them as a charm to make his father-in-law's sheep bear pied and spotted lambs. We find rhabdomancy, a popular form of divination among the Greeks, and also among the Romans. Cicero, in his De Officies, alludes to it. If all that is needful for our nourishment and support arrives to us by means of some divine rod, as people say, then each of us, free from all care and trouble, may give himself up to the exclusive pursuit of study and science. Probably it is to this rod that the illusion of Ennius, as the agent in discovering hidden treasures, quoted in the first book, of his De Diviniatoni refers. According to Vetranius Morus, Varro left a satire on the Virgula Divina, which has not been preserved. Tacitus tells us that the Germans practice some sort of divination by means of rods. For the purpose their method is simple. They cut a rod of some fruit tree into bits, and after having distinguished them by various marks, they cast them into a white cloth. Then the priest thrice draws each piece and explains the oracle according to the marks. Ammianus Marcellinus says that the Alains employed an osier rod. The fourteenth law of the Frisons ordered that the discovery of murders should be made by means of divining rods used in church. These rods should be laid before the altar and on the sacred relics, after which God was to be supplicated to indicate the culprit. This was called the Lot of Rods, or Tantine, the Rod of Rods. But the Middle Ages was the date of the full development of the superstition, and the divining rod was believed to have efficacy in discovering hidden treasures, veins of precious metal, springs of water, thefts, and murders. The first notice of its general use among late writers is in the Testamentum Novum, Book 1, Chapter 25, of Basil Valentine, a Benedictine monk of the 15th century. Basil speaks of the general faith in and adoption of this valuable instrument for the discovery of metals, which is carried by workmen in mines, either in their belts or in their caps. He says that there are seven names by which this rod is known, and to its excellences, under each title, he devotes a chapter in his book. The names are Divine Rod, Shining Rod, Leaping Rod, Transcendent Rod, Trembling Rod, Dipping Rod, Superior Rod. In his admirable treatise on metals, Agricola speaks of the rod in terms of disparagement. He considered its use as a relic of ancient magical forms, and he says that it is only irreligious workmen who employ it in their search after metals. Goclenius, however, in his treatise on the virtue of plants, stoutly does battle for the properties of the hazel rod, whereupon Roberti, a Flemish Jesuit, falls upon him tooth and nail, disputes his facts, overwhelms him with abuse, 
and gibbets him for popular ridicule. Andreas Libavius, a writer I have already quoted in my article on the Wandering Jew, undertook a series of experiments upon the hazel divining rod, and concluded that there was truth in the popular belief. The Jesuit Kircher, who experimentalized several times on wooden rods, which were declared to be sympathetic with regard to certain metals, by placing them on delicate pivots in equilibrium. But they never turned on the approach of metal. De Arte Magnetica. However, a similar course of experiments over water led him to attribute to the rod the power of indicating subterranean springs and water courses. I would not affirm it, he says, unless I had established the fact by my own experience. Descartes, another Jesuit, author of a treatise on natural springs, and of a huge tome entitled Mundus Mathematicus, declared in the latter work that no means of discovering sources is equal to the divining rod. And he quotes a friend of his, who, with a hazel rod in his hand, could discover springs with the utmost precision and facility, and could trace on the surface of the ground the course of a subterranean conduit. Another writer, Saint Romain, in his Science dégagée des Chimères de l'École, exclaims, Is it not astonishing to see a rod which is held firmly in the hands bow itself and turn visibly in the direction of water or metal, with more or less promptitude, according as the metal or water are near or remote from the surface? In 1659, the Jesuit Gaspar Schott writes that the rod is used in every town of Germany, and that he had frequently opportunity of seeing it used in the discovery of hidden treasures. I searched with the greatest care, he adds, into the question whether the hazel rod had any sympathy with gold and silver, and whether any natural property set it in motion. In like manner, I tried whether a ring of metal held suspended by a thread in the midst of a tumbler, and which strikes the hours, is moved by any similar force. I ascertained that these effects could only have rise from the deception of those holding the rod or the pendulum, or, maybe, from some diabolic impulsion, or, more likely still, because imagination sets the hand in motion. The Sieur Le Royer, a lawyer of Rouen in 1674, published his Traité du Baton Universel, in which he gives an account of a trial made with the rod in the presence of Father Jean-Francois, who had ridiculed the operation in his treatise on the science of waters published at rennes in sixteen fifty five and which succeeded in convincing the blasphemer of the divine rod le Royer denies to it the power of picking out criminals which had been popularly attributed to it and as had been unhesitatingly claimed for it by de brio in his disquisitio medica and now i am brought to the extraordinary story of jacques Aymar, which attracted the attention of Europe to the marvellous properties of the divining rod. I shall give the history of this man in full, as such an account is rendered necessary by the mutilated versions I have seen, current in English magazine articles, which follow the lead of Mrs. Crow, who narrates the earlier portion of this impostor's career, but says nothing of his expose and downfall. On the 5th of July, 1692, at about 10 o'clock in the evening, a wine-seller of Lyon and his wife, were assassinated in their cellar, and their money carried off. On the morrow, the officers of justice arrived, and examined the premises. Besides the corpses lay a large bottle wrapped in straw, and a bloody hedging bill, which undoubtedly had been the instrument used to accomplish the murder. Not a trace of those who had committed the horrible deed was to be found, and the magistrates were quite at fault as to the direction in which they should turn for a clue to the murderer or murderers. At this juncture, a neighbour reminded the magistrates of an incident which had taken place four years previous. It was this. In 1688, a theft of clothes had been made in Grenoble. In the parish of Kroll lived a man named Jacques Aymar, supposed to be endowed with a faculty of using the divining rod. This man was sent for. On reaching the spot where the theft had been committed, his rod moved in his hand. He followed the track indicated by the rod, and it continued to rotate between his fingers as long as he followed a certain direction, but ceased to turn if he diverged from it in the smallest degree. Guided by his rod, Amar went from street to street, 
till he was brought to a standstill before the prison gates. These could not be opened without leave of the magistrate, who hastened to witness the experiment. The gates were unlocked, and Amar, under the same guidance, directed his steps towards four prisoners lately incarcerated. He ordered the four to be stood in a line, and then he placed his foot on that of the first. The rod remained immovable. He passed to the second, and the rod turned at once. Before the third prisoner there were no signs. The fourth trembled and begged to be heard. He owned himself the thief, along with the second, who also acknowledged the theft, and mentioned the name of the receiver of the stolen goods. This was a farmer in the neighbourhood of Grenoble. The magistrate and officers visited him and demanded the articles he had obtained. The farmer denied all knowledge of the theft and all participation in the booty. Amar, however, by means of his rod, discovered the secreted property and restored it to the persons from whom it had been stolen. On another occasion, Amar had been in quest of a spring of water when he felt his rod turn sharply in his hand. On digging at the spot, expecting to discover an abundant source, the body of a murdered woman was found in a barrel, with a rope twisted round her neck. The poor creature was recognised as a woman of the neighbourhood who had vanished four months before. Amar went to the house which the victim had inhabited, and presented his rod to each member of the household. It turned upon the husband of the deceased, who at once took to flight. The magistrates of Lyon, at their wits' ends how to discover the perpetrators of the double murder in the wine-shop, urged the procureur du roi to make experiment of the powers of Jacques Aymar. The fellow was sent for, and he boldly asserted his capacity for detecting criminals, if he were first brought to the spot of the murder, so as to be put en rapport with the murderers. He was at once conducted to the scene of the outrage, with the rod in his hand. This remained stationary as he traversed the cellar, till he reached the spot where the body of the wine-cellar had lain. Then the stick became violently agitated, and the man's pulse rose as though he were in an access of fever. The same motions and symptoms manifested themselves when he reached the place where the second victim had lain. Having thus received his impression, Amar left the cellar, and, guided by his rod, or rather by an internal instinct, he ascended into the shop, and then stepping into the street he followed from one to another, like the hound upon the scent, the track of the murderers. It conducted him into the court of the archiepiscopal palace, across it, and down to the gates of the Rhone. It was now evening, and the city gates being all closed, the quest for blood was relinquished for the night. Next morning, Amar returned to the scent. Accompanied by three officers, he left the gate and descended the right bank of the Rhone. The rod gave indications of there having been three involved in the murder, and he pursued the traces till two of them led to a gardener's cottage. Into this he entered, and there he asserted with warmth, against the asseverations of the proprietor to the contrary, that the fugitives had entered his room, had seated themselves at his table, and had drunk wine out of one of the bottles which he indicated. Amar tested each of the household with his rod to see if there had been any contact with the murderers. The rod moved over two children only, aged respectively ten and nine years. These little things, on being questioned, answered with reluctance that during their father's absence on Sunday morning, against his express commands, they had left the door open and that two men, whom they described, had come in suddenly upon them and had seated themselves and made free with the wine in the bottle pointed out by the man with the rod. This first verification of the talents of Jacques Aymar convinced some of the sceptical, but the procurateur général forbade the prosecution of the experiment till the man had been further tested. As already stated, a hedging bill had been discovered on the scene of the murder, smeared with blood, and unquestionably the weapon with which the crime had been committed. Three bills from the same maker, and of precisely the same description, were obtained, and the four were taken into a garden, and secretly buried at intervals. Amar was then brought, staff in hand, into the garden, and conducted over the spots where lay the bills. The rod began to vibrate as his feet stood upon the place where was concealed the bill which had been used by the assassins, but was motionless elsewhere. 
Still unsatisfied, the four bills were exhumed and concealed anew. The comptroller of the province himself bandaged the sorcerer's eyes and led him by the hand from place to place. The divining rod showed no signs of movement till it approached the blood-stained weapon when it began to oscillate. The magistrates were now so far satisfied as to agree that Jacques Aymar should be authorized to follow the trail of the murderers and have a company of archers to follow him. Guided by his rod, Aymar now recommenced his pursuit. He continued tracing down the right bank of the Rhone till he came to half a league from the bridge of Lyon. Here the footprints of three men were observed in the sand, as though engaged in entering a boat. A rowing boat was obtained, and Aymar, with his escort, descended the river. He found some difficulty in following the trail upon water. Still, he was able, with a little care, to detect it. It brought him under an arch of the bridge of Vienne, which boats rarely passed beneath. This proved that the fugitives were without a guide. The way in which this curious journey was made was singular. At intervals, Aymar put ashore to test the banks with his rod and ascertain whether the murderers had landed. He discovered the places where they had slept and indicated the chairs or benches on which they had sat. In this manner, by slow degrees, he arrived at the military camp of Sablon, between Vienne and saint Valier. There Aymar felt violent agitation. His cheeks flushed and his pulse beat with rapidity. He penetrated the crowds of soldiers, but did not venture to use his rod, lest the man should take it ill and fall upon him. He could not do more without special authority, and was constrained to return to Lyon. The magistrates then provided him with the requisite powers, and he went back to the camp. Now he declared that the murderers were not there. He recommenced his pursuit, and descended the Rhone again as far as Beaucaire. On entering the town, he ascertained by means of his rod that those whom he was pursuing had parted company. He traversed several streets, then crowded on account of the annual fair, and was brought to a standstill before the prison doors. One of the murderers was within, he declared. He would track the others afterwards. Having obtained permission to enter, he was brought into the presence of fourteen or fifteen prisoners. Amongst these was a hunchback, who had only an hour previously been incarcerated on account of a theft he had committed at the fair. Aymar applied his rod to each of the prisoners in succession, it turned upon the hunchback. The sorcerer ascertained that the other two had left the town by a little path leading into the Nîmes road. Instead of following this track, he returned to Lyon with the hunchback and the guard. At Lyon, a triumph awaited him. The hunchback had hitherto protested his innocence, and declared that he had never set foot in Lyon, but as he was brought to that town by the way along which Aymar has ascertained that he had left it, the fellow was recognized at the different houses where he had lodged the night, or stopped for food. At the little town of Bagnon, he was confronted with the host and hostess of a tavern, where he and his comrades had slept, and they swore to his identity and accurately described his companions. Their description tallied with that given by the children of the gardener. The wretched man was so confused by this recognition that he avowed having stayed there a few days before along with two provencals these men he said were the criminals he had been their servant and had only kept guard in the upper room whilst they committed the murders in the cellar on his arrival in lyon he was committed to prison and his trial was decided on at the first interrogation he told his tale precisely as he had related it before with these additions the murderers spoke patois and had purchased two bills. At ten o'clock in the evening, all three had entered the wine shop. The Provençals had a large bottle wrapped in straw, and they persuaded the publican and his wife to descend with them to the cellar to fill it, whilst he, the hunchback, acted as watch in the shop. The two men murdered the wine cellar and his wife with their bills, and then mounted to the shop where they opened the coffer and stole from it one hundred and thirty crowns, eight louis d'or, and a silver belt. The crime accomplished, they took refuge in the court of a large house, this was the archbishop's palace indicated by Aymar, and passed the night in it. Next day, early, they left Lyon and only stopped for a moment at a gardener's cottage. Some way down the river, they found a boat moored to the bank. This they loosed from its mooring and entered. 
they came ashore at the spot pointed out by the man with the stick. They stayed some days at the camp at Sablon, and then went on to Beaucaire. Aymar was now sent in quest of the other murderers. He resumed their trail at the gate of Beaucaire, and that of one of them, after considerable detour, led him to the prison doors of Beaucaire, and he asked to be allowed to search among the prisoners for his man. This time he was mistaken. The second fugitive was not within, but the jailer affirmed that a man whom he described, and his description tallied with the known appearance of one of the Provençals, had called at the gate shortly after the removal of the hunchback to inquire after him, and on learning of his removal to Lyon, had hurried off precipitately. Aymar now followed his track from the prison, and this brought him to that of the third criminal. He pursued the double scent for some days, but it became evident that the two culprits had been alarmed at what had transpired in Beaucaire, and were flying from France. Aymar traced them to the frontier, and then returned to Lyon. On the 30th of August, 1692, the poor hunchback was, according to sentence, broken on the wheel, in the Place des Terreaux. On his way to execution, he had to pass the wine-shop. There the recorder publicly read his sentence, which had been delivered by thirty judges. The criminal knelt and asked for pardon of the poor wretches in whose murder he was involved, after which he continued his course to the place fixed for his execution. End of chapter 4